Okay. So again, my name is Cheryl Rigger and I work at the Dover Public Library. Our uh, program tonight is called Building the Canal in Dover. And um, the library has lots of programs coming up still in May, even though the month is half over. So we're having um, the Reeves, uh, two ladies from the Reeves home are going to talk about the book called The New Carriage. Um, on the 20th, Shanna Angel from the Farm Bureau is going to talk about how uh, farmers were affected during the COVID-19 pandemic. And on the 25th, we're having a Facebook Live of Chris Hart portraying uh, a person who was present at Fort Sumter uh, when the first shots of the American Civil War were fired. And at the end of the month, on the 27th, Alan Ladd, an author from um, Akron is going to talk about his uh, newest book called Churchill's Secret Messenger. It's a spy, you know, a spy, um, a, a spy novel, and he does a lot of research. So it's really, uh, I just enjoyed reading it. It's like a, a, a cliffhanger at the end of every chapter that makes you want to go on to the next chapter. And you can check out all of the programs that the library offers either on our website or on our Facebook page, or if you go into the library in person, you can uh, see posters in the hallway or little quarter sheets at the checkout desk that will remind you when the programs are. All right, so tonight, again, our program is called Building the Canal in Dover, and our speaker is Kim Jerkovic. She is the local uh, his, histor history librarian, and as some of you may know, the ICARVs, archives of the Dover Historical Society are located in the basement of the library now because we wanted to make those archives more accessible to the public. Unfortunately, the pandemic didn't allow us to give the accessibility that we wanted to. But if you would like to uh, see the archives, look up something, please call the library or email Kim at the library and um, set up a time so that uh, you know she can be there. She's there on Tuesdays and Thursdays. She can make an appointment with you and you can come in and look at some of the items that are archived there at, in the basement of the Dover Public Library. So really we appreciate Kim coming. Uh, the programs that she puts together are always very well researched and very interesting. And I think it always, uh, people are obviously very interested because some of the programs that she has presented have been programs that have very good attendance. And that tells me that people are very interested in our local history and they want more and more programs of that nature. So we are going to try to do that. All right, so Kim, at this time, if you would like to, uh, you're already sharing your screen, so you, the the show is yours now, all okay. right? Okay, thank you, Kim, so much. Yep, thank you for having me tonight. Um, this program uh, is something that I have kind of melded together from a lot of different things that I've put together on the canal, so it was a lot of fun to do. So tonight we're looking at the Ohio and Erie Canal and um, its impact on Dover. I'm going to start out with a story about what it was like before the canal was here um, in Tuscarawas County. If you were a settler that came in the early 1800s and you grew wheat, you had to travel 80 miles to get your wheat ground into flour. Um, you were making that trip on basically old Indian trails. Uh, they might have wanted to call them roads, but, but they weren't very good yet. So it was usually a week to two week journey to the grist mill and back. Uh, once you got there, you had to give the miller half your wheat in payment uh, for the job. And then you had to bring it back home again over those rough trails. Uh, if you needed salt, you had to travel to Cleveland to get salt. And that journey took you up the Tuscarawas River, across a portage to the Cuyahoga River, and on up to Cleveland, which once again was an arduous journey through the wilderness. So life was hard for the early settlers. Um, Ohio was pretty wild country. It was pretty isolated, but that was gonna change in the 1820s when they decided to build the Ohio Erie Canal. So first question is what is a canal? A canal is a man-made waterway used to transport goods and people. So it's not something that was here. It's not a natural resource. It was something that was man-made. So the state of Ohio was inspired by the Ohio Erie Canal, 
or by the Erie Canal in the state of New York. Uh, they had built the canal to link their lake with the Hudson River and the Port of New York. So Ohio was inspired by that, um, the way it, that it opened up the state of New York to settlement from trade and commerce. So they decided that they could do this with Ohio. Um, if they had a system that linked the Ohio River to Lake Erie, uh, that could link trade to the north that would eventually go over to New York City. It could link trade in the south from the Ohio River to the Mississippi River and on down to the ports in New Orleans. Uh, so Ohio did a lot of research, looked at a lot of different routes, and finally they decided on two of them. Uh, one would be the Miami and Erie Canal in the western part of the state. And the other one was the Ohio and Erie Canal, uh, the part of the state that we are interested in. So this is a map that shows uh, those two systems and feeder canals that were built off of them. If you can see my mouse, up here is Cleveland, uh, follows down through. Here's Dover right here, comes across and down to the Ohio River at Portsmouth. So it, it traveled a total of 308 miles uh, from Lake Erie to the Ohio River across Ohio. So the first shovel full of dirt was dug at the Licking Summit in Heath, Ohio on July 4th, 1825 by Governor DeWitt Clinton of New York. Uh, he was considered the father of the Erie Canal, so he was invited to dig the first shovel full of dirt on the Ohio and Erie Canal. Um, it took about eight years until it was completed. And the Ohio Erie Canal traveled through 12 counties of Ohio, Cuyahoga, Summit, Stark, Tuscarawas, Coshocton, Muskingum, Licking, Fairfield, Franklin, Ross, Pike, and Scioto. The total cost for the canal was $4.3 million. A uh, canal fund commission was created to sell bonds to raise money. Uh, they were sold in Ohio. They were sold in New York. They were sold abroad. John Jacob Astor of, of the fur trade loaned the state of Ohio $1 million towards the building of the canal. And then the federal government gave land grants uh, to Ohio of 1,100,351 acres. They could be sold at $2 an acre to help raise funds to build the waterway. Uh, in return, the federal government was allowed to use it without paying tolls. So let's build the canal. Um, it was built in the state from 1825 to 1834, and it was built here in Tuscarawas County from 1826 to 1830. Now, they didn't start at one end and dig all the way continuously to the other. So like they didn't start at Lake Erie and dig south and, and just make it continuous as they went. It was done in pieces. Um, each time a big enough section was finished, they'd go ahead and put water into it and open it up for use. So the first section that was completed was from Cleveland to Akron. Um, I think that's one of the uh, amazing parts of this engineering feat was that it wasn't just a continuous line. They did it in pieces and, and it all came together. Um, they didn't get somewhere and one piece was 50 feet off from the other piece. So um, I thought that part was impressive about how it was built. Uh, if you look at some of the dimensions, uh, this is a lovely hand drawing to show the, the dimensions of the canal, but it was 40 feet wide at the top. And you can see the bottom is more narrow. It was 26 feet wide at the, at the base of the canal. The average depth was four feet. Um, in some places it was deeper than that, uh, but it needed to be at least four feet deep. Uh, the side that had the towpath was 10 feet wide, and then the heel path on the other side was six feet wide with an embankment. Each Jim, section, yes. We are not seeing that graphic. Did you say it was a hand? Oh, there it is. Okay, now we got it. Did it come up? Yes, okay. it did now. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm sorry. That's all right. That gives us a good idea. Okay, thank you. Yes. Yes. I wonder if my mouse was somewhere weird. Okay. Okay, so it was built um, in sections, so it was often individual contractors that did it. It wasn't one um, person who oversaw it all. The one-mile sections of the canal were let out to individual contractors. So at first, um, there was a lot of bidding going on 
for the work. Um, great competition to get a section. But soon the contractors realized what hard work it was uh, to actually undertake this digging. And some men subcontracted out the work. Um, there was a lot of dishonesty in the system and misunderstanding of what was going to go on. But um, eventually the whole thing does get completed. Um, in Dover, um, Christian Deerdorf was the founder of the Dover of Dover, and he had a section of the canal. Abraham Shane, who lived in Dover for a while and eventually founded the village of Shanesville, had a couple sections in the area um, near Dover. Some of the original engineers on the project came from New York and had worked on the Erie Canal, but eventually um, local ones emerged also that did a lot of the engineering. Um, a lot of the labor was done by Irish and German immigrants. Uh, they, they came to America looking for work and they came to work building the canals. A lot of the farmers in the area also went to work digging the canal too though because this was a way to earn money. Uh, most of them at this time were still living on the barter system where I was going to trade you a pig for a bushel of wheat. Uh, but this was a way to earn cash was to work on the canal. Uh, it was considered quite dangerous and it was characterized by a lot of illness. Uh, they didn't realize that standing water was what was causing their illnesses, uh, but there was a lot of illness on the canal. In 1827, there was a work stoppage across the state as they were building it because they were hit with malaria. And sometimes the canal was referred to as the Irish graveyard. And they said for every mile of canal, there was at least one dead man. So as they were building the canal, there were different stages of work that had to be done. Uh, first was the so, grubbing. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt. So we're, oh, there we go. Oh, there Is we it go. Coming? We got it. Yes, now we got it. Thank you. It might I'm be sorry. taking a little bit to load, like the a lag time here. So I'll kind of pause between each one to make sure they're coming up. Okay. So first was grubbing and cleaning. And this involved clearing off the 80 foot wide path of, of debris and trees. And they said when Ohio was founded, if you were a squirrel, you could travel across the entire straight, the entire state without ever touching the ground because there were so many trees. So this was pretty labor intensive work to clear the trees. Um, they had to pull out all the stumps, all that work. Next came the muggy, mucking and ditching, which this was further clearing the land and a little bit wider path. And then the embankment and excavation was the actual digging of the canal. Um, this was removing rocks, dirt, and digging it down to the minimum of four feet. Now, today we would have steam shovels and backhoes and all kinds of equipment to do that. These guys were doing this with shovels and pickaxes and wheelbarrows. So extremely labor intensive work without any kind of machines to help you out. Uh, once it was dug then, uh, they had to build locks, culverts, and puddling. Uh, we're going to talk about locks a little bit more later. Uh, the culverts were built over streams. And then puddling was what was done to the base of the canal uh, to get it ready to put water into it. So they would put in a layer of gravel or clay, saturate it with water, and then they would bring livestock in to walk across it and pack it down. Uh, the sheep was one of the best. Uh, the way the sheep's feet were shaped were the best uh, ones to pack it down the best. So eventually they did make a tool called the sheep foot roller that they were able to use to tamp it down uh, to create a solid base so that it would hold the water. And then the final step was protection in areas where they had to put in stones to help support the walls or prevent damage to it. Um, workers worked from, oh, I forgot I had this. There we go. Tools of the trade, uh, here you can see the shovels. Uh, the middle one is a wood scoop that lifted the dirt out. And then of course a wheelbarrow to bring it up the sides. Just think as, it, as they dug deeper and deeper, that would get harder and harder to get the dirt up over the sides of that. And so the workers worked uh, from sunup to sundown, 26 days a month. Uh, it was seasonal. In the winter, the ground would freeze, so you didn't dig in the winter, but early spring to late fall. Uh, they were paid about 30 cents a day. It can end up to be about 7 to $10 a month. Usually the workers received food, shelter, and a jigger of whiskey every day. 
And once it was complete, it took about 80 hours if you wanted to go from Cleveland to Portsmouth. Uh, most people didn't travel that way, though. Usually it was just used in sections that you would just go a little bit of a way uh, back and forth, like from Akron to Cleveland, uh, from Dover to, to Akron and back instead of going the whole, way, whole uh, 308 miles of the canal. Um, it could be unpredictable travel because of the weather. Um, if there was a big rainstorm, areas of it could be washed away and they'd have to repair it. It was also could be smelly. Uh, <laughs> the canal wasn't a river, so the water wasn't flowing like the water in a river flows. So it could become stagnant and stinky. So here in Tuscarawas County, the canal went through eight of the 22 townships. So it started in Lawrence Township near Bolivar, headed south through Fairfield Township, Dover, Goshen, Warwick, Clay, Salem, and then Oxford Township, and it left the county near Newcomer's Town. So it entered the county by crossing over an aqueduct, which an aqueduct was like a bridge for a boat. Um, it was wooden, the water would flow through it, and it crossed over the Tuscarawas River. Um, as it traversed across the county, it, there was a change in elevation of 124 feet. So they had to use locks for that change in elevation. And here in Tuscarawas County, we have had locks numbers seven through 21. Uh, other features were a guard lock that was used to get um, in and out of the river. You could go from the, from the canal into the Tuscarawas River. There were two feeder dams that helped put water into the canal here and then 70 or 24 stone culverts that went over streams. So the first boat to traverse the canal in the county was called the Union. If you remember Excuse back me. to- I'm, I have to interrupt again. We are yep. still about where the people got that paid. Okay, now we're looking at the townships. And townships, the okay. Okay, so I think now we're ready for the next one perhaps. Okay, I didn't move it yet. So we're, I was still on oh, this Oh, okay, one. I'm sorry, okay. That's okay, that's okay. All right. <laughs> but the first boat to travel on the canal was the Union, which was owned by Christian Deerdorf. Um, that, that name pops up a lot in Dover history. Once again, he was the founder of Dover. Uh, left Dover on October 29th, 1829, and traveled north on the canal. That boat and its six horses cost $2,123. And the canal in the entire county... Uh, from the north in Bolivar down to Newcomer's Town was completed by August of 1830. All right, I changed it now. Did yes, it? we're seeing it. Okay, very good. Um, canal boats, what made them go? Uh, they were mule powered or horse powered. Um, you would have a team of two horses or mules who walked along the towpath. They would be hooked to your boat by a 70 to 90 foot tow rope. They usually had at least two teams of horses or mules so that one, one set got tired, you weren't done for the day. You'd get out the other set and keep going. Each boat needed a crew of at least two people. You had to have a, a mule driver and you had to have a steersman to steer the boat. Um, if you were a more affluent uh, canal boat team, you might have more crew members on board also. Uh, the canal was wide enough for boats to pass one another. Um, they kind of had a system out for that. The northbound boat would hug the towpath and its horses would come in close. The southbound boat would go to the far side and their horses to the far side of the tow boat, towpath. Um, the southbound boat would drop its tow line into the water and they'd pass by one another. So here's a picture of a boat. Um, this is somewhere in Tuscarawas County. And you can see the two mules up front and then the boat's just coming in on the right side of the picture. So that kind of gives you an idea how, how long the tow ropes could be um, that were used. And then this is another picture that shows, uh, that is the Worcester Avenue Bridge. And you can see this is later, there's a trolley car on there, but you can see um, the towpath is here in the middle on the, the right-hand side, 
is the canal, and on the left-hand side is the Tuscarawas River. And then this next one is looking uh, towards the Worcester Avenue Bridge from the Tuscarawas Avenue Bridge. So this time the canal is on the left-hand side, towpath down the middle, and then the river on the right-hand side. And then this one's looking uh, from the Worcester Avenue Bridge um, towards the east end of town. I had to think about my directions there for a minute. Uh, so once again, the canal's right there in the middle, towpath on the right, and you can just see a little bit of the river on the far right. And then um, the street right above on the left-hand side that you can see is Front Street. So this is a canal boat drawing, uh, sh shows some of the compartments in a, in a boat. They were 78 feet long and usually 12 to 14 feet wide. So they were very uh, wide, skinny boats. Usually there was a stable in the middle where they'd keep their extra set of horses. Um, this one's a cargo boat, so it has areas for cargo on each side of that. And then the front and the back parts could carry passengers, or sometimes families actually lived on the canal boats when they were running them um, through the seasonal weather. So just like on our highways today, there were different kind of boats traveling on the canal. Uh, this first one is a cargo boat. And you can see um, the middle section here for the horses. And then this one's probably hauling coal along the canal. This is somewhere near New Philly. This picture is described as. Um, the cargo boats would haul things like coal, lumber, wheat, butter, nails. Um, and you could have a covered cargo boat if you had something that couldn't really get wet. Or you could have an uh, open bins on the cargo boat. So these are kind of like semi-trucks on the canal. They're hauling the freight. Another kind was the passenger packet or packet boat. These are like buses. These were carrying the people. Um, this picture, if you pay close attention, is sort of weird because this boat is on a road. Uh, it had wheels under it, was being used in a parade. Um, but this is a passenger packet. Um, it just carried people. And you can see the people on the top. If it was a warm day, sometimes they would ride on the tops of the boats uh, to stay cool. And the passenger boats could travel a little bit faster than the cargo boats. Cargo boats traveled an average of 1.5 miles per hour. Uh, passenger boats would go about four miles per hour. And then the last boat was the state boat. Um, this is the highway patrol of the canal. Uh, there was actually a speed limit on the canal. The top speed was supposed to be four miles per hour. And that was because if the boat was going too fast, it could create a wake and it could wash out the sides of the canal. So you couldn't go too fast in your boat. Uh, the state boats also took care of the canal. If there was a storm and a washout in an area, they would come repair the sides. Uh, if there was trees down over the towpath, they would come and um, take care of those trees and take care of the towpaths. So the state boats were like your highway patrol and, and like your state highway trucks that would come and take care of things. All right, so we'll get to locks here finally. I've mentioned them a couple times. So what exactly are the locks? They were like stair steps for the boats. So when you were traveling from Cleveland to Portsmouth, of course, Ohio is not flat. And it wasn't like the log flume, flume ride at Cedar Point. You couldn't take your canal boat and go whooshing downhill. So they had to figure out uh, what to use to raise and lower the elevation. So they used the locks. Uh, they're made from sandstone. And they have wooden doors and wooden floors on them. Um, you could enter one from one level. Um, if, you, if you were on the lower level, you entered into the lock with just a tiny bit of water in the bottom. They'd close the doors and they'd slowly let water in and raise the level up to the upper level of water above you and then let you out onto that upper level or vice versa. They'd, you'd go into a filled lock. It would be emptied slowly while the boat was in there and you'd go into the lower level. So this is a drawing of a typical plan of a lock uh, made with the sandstone. 
1906, there was a program to make some improvements and some of them were cemented over. So like the one on the south side of New Philly, that lock that you can still see there has cement on it. Um, that was a project that was done later. So they were originally sandstone. So here are some pictures of some locks in the area. This lock is known as Jones Lock, and this was the closest lock to Dover. This was lock number 12. And so the boat would come in on the upper end here. That's the higher end. Enter the lock, let the water out, and then we'd go down into the lower level of water here. Um, on average, it took about 40 minutes for the entire locking through process. Um, oftentimes, two boats might come up to the lock at the same time. They said uh, there's no protocol for exactly how you went through those locks other than the crew that could fight the best usually got to go first. And this lock is located just outside of Dover on Route 800. It is no longer there. Um, this is a picture from Port Washington. And this lock's right uh, I believe as you were heading into town was there where this one was located. And this one you can see they're coming into a filled lock. So then they're going to be letting the water out into the lower level. This is lock seven near Zor. And you can see this one they're filling with water. You can see the water rushing in on the end there. And then this is another lock at Zor. And this is a boat coming out the bottom level it's it's you can see the top level of water back here behind them so that one was lowered down and then this is a boat in a lock at lock 17. that's down near Janate and hutton and then uh, you see locks in different places today this one's a pretty well restored one that's in the Cuyahoga Valley National Park up in Peninsula. Uh, the one over here on the right top is the lock near um, Canal Fulton. If you take a ride on the St. Helena 2 or 3, I think it is up there, um, that's right near where you turn around. You don't actually get to go through the lock, but you can see it. And then the lock on the lower right is lock 15 that was it's in Tusky. They have kind of a little park around that one. Um, a great feature of the canal in Dover was the toll booth. Um, the canal system was like our turnpikes today. It wasn't free to use. You had to pay a toll to go on the canal and it depended on how many people you had on board, how far you were traveling, what kind of uh, things you were hauling. Um, those things all determined what your toll was going to be. So Dover was the only toll booth in Tuscarawas County. So every boat that came through T Tuscarawas County, came through Dover, had to stop there and pay a toll. So here is the toll booth right here in the middle of this picture, really. That's the Tuscarawas Avenue bridge there. And then this was the toll booth. So every boat that came through, whether it was going north or south, had to stop at the toll booth and pay their toll. Now, one thing that made this great was that if you were stopping to pay your toll, you might also decide to stop and get some provisions for your boat. So you're gonna do some shopping in Dover. Uh, you might decide your horse or your mules needed new shoes. And so you visited the blacksmith that was here in Dover. Maybe you had a really lucrative uh, trip with your canal. You had some extra money and you guys decided to eat a meal and spend the night in a real hotel instead of sleeping on your canal boat that night. So um, the toll booth was a great thing for Dover that it made every boat stop here. Um, it also gives you an idea of the numbers of things that were hauled on the canal by some of the toll booth numbers. Um, in 1850, these are some of the numbers that were recorded at Dover's toll booth. 451,000 bushels of wheat, 39,000 bushels of flour, 250,000 pounds of butter went through Dover on the canal, uh, 101,000 pounds of bacon, 580,000 pounds of pig iron, and almost 3,000 barrels of whiskey. 
So there was quite a bit of commerce going on up and down the canal. Another important feature in town is right here in the middle of this map where it says basin. Uh, the basin was an area where the boats could pull into to dock. Uh, they could turn around there. They could get repairs in a dry dock there. So this is sort of like the toll booth too. The fact that Dover had a basin, it was an area where the boats could stop and it helped draw people to the area and create business in the town. So before we move on too much further, we'll talk about some of the drawbacks of the canal. Um, first off, try to drive your car four miles per hour. Uh, you, you, it's really hard to make a car go that slow. Uh, so it was a slow way to move things. Now, it was a great improvement from the trails that they were trying to use, uh, but it was slow. And when better technology came around, uh, this canal stopped being used quite as much. Second is the seasonal issue. Uh, the canal froze in the winter, so you couldn't use it um, from November through March, uh, different times of the year because of it being frozen. Uh, this is a fun picture because this is actually in Dover. This is the Worcester Avenue Bridge here in the background, and you can see one of the hotels up along Front Street there. And there's a group of boys playing there on the ice and a guy walking down the canal. But even though it had some problems, uh, you can't underestimate the impact that the canal had to develop Ohio during this time period. Um, it opened up an area where before it was treacherous to travel, it took a long time, and it opened up Ohio to the nation's market economy. Um, one canal book stated, the routes adopted were a singular compromise of geographical, economical, and political requirements that sought the greatest good for the greatest number of people in the state of Ohio. Uh, 1851 was the high point of the canal era as it transformed Ohio from a subsistence economy where you just grew the things you needed to live to a market-based economy where they were growing things and taking them to market. It changed Ohio from a wilderness to a prosperous agricultural area and then moved from that to a prosperous industrial area. So these are some of the numbers on this screen that show the impact of the canal uh, using numbers. So the population of the 36 counties along the canal, this counts both the Ohio Erie and the Miami and Erie, uh, was 1.15 million. Um, and the 52 away from that, it was 1.19 million. But the tax value along the 36 that were along the canal was 400 and almost $70 million versus 420 million for the ones not along the canal. Um, in the years that it, it was prosperous, it gave a net revenue of $4 million for the state of Ohio. And for the counties that were located along the canal, there was a gain in wealth of 539% from being in that area. So those are kind of direct effects that you can see. Indirect effects were it cheapened transportation costs. It increased the value of land and products. Uh, wheat went from an average price of about 75 cents to $3. Um, it influenced settlement, it developed agriculture and mining, commerce, manufacturing, and it laid the base for Ohio's industrial, commercial, and political power. Um, it brought kind of differing areas in the state together. Um, if you were along the canal, it turned it into a, a homogenous area, people with the same kind of interests. Um, it created a snowball effect because it it cheapened transportation. It gave you access to areas where you had a hard time getting to before. Um, it, it made wider markets, so then in production increased. If production was increased, people gained more wealth, and that could be invested in other things. So industry was stimulated, natural resources were developed, and more wealth was created, which created even more new investments. Yes, Kim, we yes. are still frozen. Oh, now, okay, now leave that slide up a little bit okay. because we were we were on the frozen river <laughs> you were frozen on the frozen river yes we were <laughs> all right so now we're looking at the population yes the tax and, value and the tax value and the net revenue i i'm impressed by that the gain of wealth yes in the counties along the canal is quite significant okay 
All right, now we're ready to move on. It's just that okay. it's like, like it's slower. Yeah. You're talking about the slide, but we're not seeing the slide. Yet. <laughs> okay. Okay. And I think um, looking at, at these numbers and talking about the development, I think if you think about Tuscarawas County, I mean, you can kind of follow the development Tuscarawas County of your, your bigger areas are Bolivar, Dover, New Philly, uh, Newcomers Town. So it kind of, I mean, you can kind of see how the canal still influenced that with some of the bigger areas. Yurksville had a feeder over to the canal. So you got the Yurksville Denison area. So you can still see the influence of the, of the canal today, I think, on settlement in Tuscarawas County a little bit. So let's look at specifically at Dover here. Uh, before the canal came to Dover, New Philly was founded in 1804. Dover was founded in 1807. Uh, both Christian Deerdorf and John Nisley wanted their town to be the county seat of Tuscarawas County. Tuscarawas County was formed in 1808. Um, if you look at Dover Square, it's pretty big. You could put a courthouse there somewhere. So there's kind of a competition from the start between Dover and New Philly. Um, back in 1808, New Philly won that first contest. Uh, they were chosen as the county seat. So therefore, you know, government business was conducted at the county seat. Land deals were done at the county seat. There wasn't a lot of reason to go to Dover. Um, it was only three miles away. So it wasn't like it was a day's journey and you needed to spend the night there if you were traveling. Um, so Dover in 1820 had a population of 46 people. Now, are we supposed to be seeing another slide? Yeah. Oh, there it is. Okay. All right. Okay. So 1820, 46 people in Dover. So then the canal was built between 1826 and 1830. And by 1840, there are 598 people in Dover and it is the largest town in Tuscarawas County. In another 10 years, it doubles in size. Uh, wow. So you, you can see that the canal was very important. New Philly might've been the, the county seat, but Dover got the canal. Uh, money came into the area, warehouses were built, uh, they were sending out wheat and corn, flour, pork, butter, eggs, lard, um, and there's a little book called The Reminiscences of Dover, and in it, it states, Dover became a great wheat market for this and neighboring counties. Businessmen of all grades and occupations came and established themselves here. A great number of our present citizens and others came between the years 1830 and 1840. Warehouses and stores multiplied fast to accommodate the business. The competition was so great among wheat buyers that the runners would go out on different routes to meet the teams coming in. When they would jump on the wagon, ride a little way and make their bargain, then get off and go back to meet the next one. So it was a bustling, bustling wheat center. Um, so this last part here, we're going to look at some photos. So, so hopefully. we're still, we're, oh, okay. Now we're Is looking the, at the, at like a map. map. Okay. So um, we're looking at the area here from Factory to 3rd to Walnut, 2nd Street, Front Street. All those little black and gray dots on those little squares are all businesses. And um, over here, you can see a factory and a mill and a warehouse. So this is in 1870 is this map. So you can kind of see quite the development of stores and things in that area on um, between Front Street and Third Street and Factory Street becomes Tuscarawas Avenue. So in 1839, there were three hotels, five merchants, four grocers, four tailors, and six shoemakers already established in Dover. And this is a drawing from an 1884 map that once again shows kind of that same area and all the little businesses and stuff along Factory Street here and Front Street. And you can see some horses here on the canal. There's another boat down here. And then this area here is the basin where they could go in and dock. So this is one of the earliest hotels. Did it change? The yes, Iron it did. Yes, okay. it did. <laughs> the Iron City House was one of the earliest hotels in Dover. It eventually gets its name changed to the Riverside Inn. 
So here's a photo of it as the Riverside Inn. And then this is a photo of it. I'm going to say right around 2000, maybe. I'm not sure what year they tore it down, but it was on Front Street for quite a long time. And, and then it was finally torn down. And then this is a photo. Um, this is the, the river. You got some boaters out on the river. Files Boathouse sat along the canal towpath trail. Um, the line that you can see kind of here through the middle is where the canal would be. And then up here is the Riverside Inn. And then another uh, well-known hotel in town was the America House, which is over here. So that's some development along Front Street. This, see where it says Tuscarawas Coal and Iron Company and Furnace? Do you have that map? Yes, we have that map. Okay. Uh, the blast furnace was built in 1854 in Dover. Um, kind of took it a while to become successful. It went in and out of different hands for a while, but it was started in 1854. And then right here it says Hardesty G Mill. That's the grist mill where they were making flour. Um, that Deerdorf built the original mill in 1830, and then it became the Cascade Mill and owned by Hardesty's later on. And then in 1842 uh, was the Dover City Mills, which was another mill that was owned by Hardesty. And so here's a drawing from the 1875 Atlas of Tuscarawas County of the Blast Furnace. Yes, we're seeing that. Okay, and then this is a drawing from the 1884 map showing the blast furnace. And we see that too. Okay, and the, over here on the mm -hmm. far right, the building with the sevens, one of the flowering mills. And then this is a, a postcard of the blast furnace from right around the turn of the century. And Yes, we see it. Let's see, is that the one with the boat now? And then this kind of shows the general area again. And then this one's a little wider view of the uh, without the blast furnace in it. And you can see these, uh, this is a mill and a planing mill here along the canal. And then these are warehouses. So between the canal and the river, they built these mills and then here um, by the basin were warehouses. And then this is a picture of the city mills. This is the one that was near the blast furnace. And I apologize that that one's so light. That was, as, that was as good as I could find. And then this one is the Cascade Mill. And this is the one that was between the canal and the river. Now, is that flooded? <laughs> yeah. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, that that was the one I could find at this mill. It was it was a flood picture. And then this is kind of a aerial view of that that general area. Uh, the white building here in the middle is the city mill. You can see the blast furnace over here. This is one of the warehouses. This is the planing mill, becomes a furniture factory. And then um, to the left would be the other uh, Cascade Mill building. This is a tar plant here. And then this is the steeple of St. Joe's Catholic Church here in the distance. Oh, yeah. Can, can you all see that at the top right? like where the horizon is, see where the steeple, your, your arrow is small. So <laughs> yeah, there it is. Hmm. And really small over here by this warehouse, there's actually a canal boat in the basin area right there. That's kind of hard to see. Right. But that would be the Tuscarawas Avenue bridge. And we see the little toll house there like yes. on the bridge, right? To the right of it. Mm -hmm. Yes. 
Yep, there's the toll house right there. Yep. Okay. And then this area is um, kind of near, you can see it clear at the bottom here on the map, the fairgrounds. So then just north of the fairgrounds was the fire brick works. Uh, there was a clay plant there to make bricks. And then the Dover rolling mill. Um, the fire brick plant was started in 1869 and the Dover rolling mill was started in 1866. And that is the mill that Mr. Reeves eventually purchases in the 1880s. Um, it becomes the American Sheet and Tin Plate Company after he builds his other mill over on the other side of Worcester Avenue. And then I think at least one of those buildings that was part of the GE plant was still one of the original buildings from the Dover Rolling Mill. Uh, this once again is the drawing. So uh, this building right here, I think there's an 18 on that. That's the fire brick works. And then the one here, it looks like it's a 23 on the roof. That's the rolling mill. So this would be Tuscarawas Avenue where the little horse and buggy is. And then here's a drawing. Um, this would be the towpath here across the bottom, the Tuscarawas River and then the rolling mill. And then there were a lot of carriage manufacturers, uh, blacksmiths, all kinds of blacksmiths in town that were started during the canal era. Uh, Toomey's started in 1854 as a carriage works. And they became famous all over the world for their racing sulkies. And then this kind of shows a bustling third street. Um, there's some horses and carriages there, but all the buildings and, and uh, shops that were along there. So the beginning of the end comes for the canal in the 1850s when the iron horse comes to Tuscarawas County. Oh, I forgot the brewery. Over here's the brewery and then you can see its roofs here in this photo. So the brewery was also started. Do I have the year on that one? I don't have the year on that one. I think it was 1860s. Um, so the beginning of the end for the canal comes with the iron horse. Uh, the first railroad comes to Tuscarawas County in 1854. And in Ohio, between 1850 and 1860, um, there were 375 miles of rail lines in Ohio in 1850. And by 1860, there were 2,946 miles of rail lines. Uh, the railroads were not seasonal. You could go uh, no matter what the weather was and they could go a lot faster. So the rail lines uh, started the, the beginning of the end for the canal. It was still sometimes used for leisure trips. And it could also be used for things that didn't necessarily have to be shipped quickly. Um, it became popular though to like travel to Zor on a leisure trip, travel up to Cleveland on a leisure trip on the canal. So here's a picture of um, Yankee Dan's Island. Um, and that boat's actually in the river right now, but sometimes they would go on excursions there. It was about a mile north of Dover. So you could go on the canal or you could go in the river. That would be a leisure trip. Uh, but the real end of the canal came in March of 1913. Uh, first, the river was frozen. So you can see the chunks of ice in the river here. Here's another one with the frozen river. These were taken on March 23rd. I believe it's on March 25th, it starts to rain and it just keeps raining across Ohio and there were floods across the entire state. And that was the end of the Ohio Erie Canal. It was washed out um, in so many places that it was not repaired. So there's the toll booth. Our friend, the toll booth, there's the building beside it, ended up kind of running into it. Uh, this picture you can see down on the bottom, it's March 27th. All the people are lined uh, along the bridge, looking at the high water. And then this is a, kind of a photo of the aftermath. You can see how 
um, how damaged the canal banks are from the flooding. And so now here at the end, I just have quite a few pictures of the flood in the Dover area. Uh, it's sort of amazing to see some of these. This is Tin Town. Um, so at the bottom of the photo would be Worcester Avenue. And then this is Broad Street that you turn to go back towards the Reeves Mill. That's the Reeves Mill there in the background. So um, this picture is kind of fun because if you look close, there's people in boats down here. And then this kind of kind of a black dot here, but this is a person in a boat there also. Then this would be um, also broad. This is the Worcester Avenue Bridge. This was another one of the breweries in town, which part of this building is still on uh, Chuck Nicholson's car lot. So this is the road that goes by there, completely underwater. And then this one shows the aftermath. This is kind of looking the opposite direction down that street. This was the bottling house for the brewery, but just the mud and debris covering the street once the water went down. I think this picture is amazing too because of these really nice houses that were on that street. This is the Dover Manufacturing Company's factory. And this is another view of that same building. And then this is that building collapsed. It eventually collapsed from the flooding. Um, this is the American Sheet and Tin Plate Company here in the background. And this is a view looking towards, this is the canal right here in front of us, then the river. American Sheet and Tid Play Company. Here's um, the flour mill that was on the area between the river and the canal that was in some of those other pictures. So you can just see how extensive the flooding was. This is the blast furnace on the left. So it got that close. then I'm not sure if that's the American Sheet and Tin Plate Company or if that's the Dover Forge and Iron Company that was over on uh, near River Street on the other side of Tuscarawas Avenue. And so that is the last one I have. All right, great. There we go. Okay, so now at this point, um, if you have questions or comments, you can unmute yourself and uh, tell us or, you know, make a question or a comment, or you can write your question in the chat box if you want, and I'll keep my eye on it and read what you want to know. Um, well, people have already said they liked it. They enjoyed learning about it. That's very good. Yes. Thank you. There's always something to learn. Anybody have a question or a comment? Let's see, I'm gonna put in my... There we go, I put my, I put my email address on there. Somebody asked about sharing the Google Doc. And if you email me, I can, I can share oh, that with okay. you. Okay. All right. Um, so I don't, did you put it in the chat or on your screen sharing? I put in the chat. I put my email on the chat. I don't see it. Oh, did it go just to one person? Maybe. I don't, I, I might do, not. Because I don't see it. Let's see. I'll you can. Again. Okay. Um, somebody's asking what they did about the flooding after 1913. They built the Muskingum Watershed Conservancy District. Um, that was in the 1930s that they built um, like Atwood Lake, Tappan Lake, Salt Fork Lake, Piedmont Lake, Leesville Lake, all the lakes and dams, Dover Dam, 
um, all that system of lakes and dams throughout this area, throughout the Muskingum Valley, um, those were built to control the flooding. And so it will not flood Marietta. It will not flood Dover and New Philly. Um, I guess it will flood Zorville <laughs> if they, if they yes. hold the water back. Um, but it, it won't flood the areas downstream from there. So yeah, all the Muskingum Lakes and the dam systems, uh, Bolivar Dam, the Zor Levee, all those were built to control the flooding so that Ohio wouldn't flood like that again, this part of Ohio. You said that the Irish and Germans came to dig the canal. Which groups of people uh, were responsible for the railroad laying of the track? I don't know the answer to that for sure. My guess would be the same ones because, I mean, this area is full of German immigrants. Yes. So I would guess that they are who built the railroads then also. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. On those pictures of the Riverside Hotel, were there balconies? Because there were some doors that were just like hanging in the air. <laughs> so there must have been balconies on that front side. Yeah. Yeah. Because I noticed that there were like above the main door, there were two other doors, but there was no way to step out. So I'm assuming there would be balconies. On balconies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There, I think I figured out how to type my Okay. Email address to everybody. Yeah, there it is. There it's we in go. The chat room now, everybody. I figured it out. <laughs> there you go. So it's kyurkovic at doverlibrary.org. Okay. Yep. Somebody wants to know if there were a lot of businesses that were wiped out forever by the flooding that they were not able to come back and rebuild. From what I know of, I'm going to say no, because the Dover Manufacturing Company that you saw the building collapse, um, they still existed for quite a few years. They um, eventually made, well, they made asbestos irons, and then eventually they made the Lady Dover iron, which those were around for a very long time. Um, I know the, the, sheet, the, the sheet mill company was still there. The slag company was still there. Mm-hmm. They, re, they redid the railroad through that area because the railroad still went through that area, even though it dug up the tracks. I mean, I think the main thing that happened was the canal was destroyed. Did they have to dredge those canals? Yeah, that was part of the work that they would do on them sometimes, um, right. that they would go through. There's actually a photo, and it might be might be at the Tuscarawas County Archives that has um, some kind of machine on like a, a raft going through and that's what they were doing was dredging and cleaning it out. So that, that was part of the regular maintenance. They probably did all the time on it to keep it clear. Mm -hmm. Other questions or comments? I just can't imagine, you know, the, the labor that it took to right. dig those. Yes. And the, um, Zor Village paid off a lot of their debt by doing quite a few sections of the canal. And that's what there's stories about the women carrying baskets of dirt on their head up out as they were digging it and using their aprons to carry dirt. But yeah, just so much intensive work and all by hand. Mm -hmm. Just amazing. Yeah. Well, but I guess too, like you said, look at the, look at the economic, and agricultural and industrial impact mm -hmm. that canal had on the towns that were along the canal. Yep. And, you know, when you talked about how the canal went, that like major settlements were like per, um, that uh, gained advantage from being along the canal, Bolivar, Dover, Philly, Tuscross, you know, uh, those are the same places that the 77 went through. It goes through, right. So right. it kind of follows those same, you have to serve, once those areas become established, you have to make sure they have, you know, uh, transportation mm -hmm. available and like infrastructure to keep those uh, industries going and those populations going. So that's yep. very interesting, I think. And the, I mean, the canal is what made Akron a town. It's what made it mm -hmm. a big milling center. Mm-hmm. Because there were a bunch of locks there. It took you a really long time to lock through Akron because it was such a change in elevation there. Mm, mm -hmm. 
I remember uh, some student was doing a report when I was a teacher. They were doing a report, um, and what they had to they had to prove how building a town on the water was a great thing. You know, like near the water supply. Mm -hmm. So when you look at some of the big industrial towns in our area, Cleveland, Pittsburgh, uh, and you know Marietta, you know down along the river, it's a great thing to have that water because you have such a resource there for mills and for transportation. But the flooding, you you have a great yeah. disadvantage as well. But yep. Well, and the the canal was important enough. New Philly saw it as important enough. They built something called the lateral canal that. Um, from kind of near West High Avenue, near the bridge over the Tuscarawas River there, they built a, a, like a mile long stretch that hooked some of their mills to the canal. And it, like in Yerkesville, they used the Tuscarawas River and the Stillwater Creek. And then there was a feeder that went into the canal at Tuskegee. And they used that so that Yerkesville got benefits from it too. So even the, the few towns not right along it, they, they built themselves something so that they can be involved in, in that trade also mm -hmm. and use it. Well, I'm sure they saw the advantages of that, you mm -hmm. know. And I, I also think about the men who founded our area, who set up these towns, what vision they had. They yes. saw that the Erie Canal was a great thing for, you know, the states along the, you know, like the New York state. And they studied it and said, hey, we want that here. Mm -hmm. And they invested in it and they got people to invest in it. And it came true, but it certainly was a, it certainly made a difference in the history. Like you said, it made us from a wilderness into a agricultural center to an industrial yep. center. So, yep. yeah. Thank goodness some people have visions <laughs> right. of the future. And are willing to take risks because it's a big risk. Mm -hmm. You know, like you say, building all those in sections, what were the chances that they would all come together at right. the right time and right, you know, and yeah. not be off a bit? Yeah. Yes. Other comments? Well, I certainly thank everybody for uh, joining in with us this evening. Uh, I think we learned a lot about our town. Um, and um, I think it's always interesting. You know, I will say this for myself, I hear it and then next week I won't be able to remember the dates <laughs> or whatever, the details. But at least I think it's, uh, it's fascinating to hear it the first time. Something will stick with me that I didn't know the last time. And also, Thanks to Kim, because Kim is showing us uh, what's available in the archives that we have, like all those postcards and pictures, yeah. you know, it, it's, it's a treasure that we have there at the library to have the Dover Historical Society archives there. So just remember that if you're looking for something or you want to know more, something more about it, remember to contact Kim, contact the library, and... Um, you can um, you can find out more about it. So always that always that advantage of having the archives right here in the library. So all right. So I guess we're done for this evening. Well, thank you everybody for coming. It was very interesting. And check out the website. See what else is coming up later on in the year. I can't tell you exactly. Maybe did we say? Uh, August, perhaps, Kim? That's what I was trying to think. Is August, it August 10th. August okay. 10th. Uh, Kim is going to have another program. So it'll be on our website. It'll be out there. It'll be in the newspaper, hopefully, and people will see it advertised and you can zoom in and learn something about the local history. Thanks to Kim Jerkovic, our local historic. I always get your title mixed up. Will you please set me straight? Local history librarian. Local history librarian and doing a great job at it and sharing with us. So thanks everybody for joining in tonight. We had a nice Thank time. Thank you. Thank you, Kim, so much. Yep.